do I have this day an opinion, a personal opinion, on the outcome in Roe versus Wade? And my answer to you is that I do not. But do you think there is as fundamental a concern uh, as legitimacy of the court uh, would be involved if Roe were to be overturned? Well, Mr. Chairman, I think that there, the legitimacy of the court would be undermined in any case if the court made a decision based on its perception of public opinion. So a good judge will consider it as precedent of the United States Supreme Court worthy as treatment of precedent like any other. Senator, I um, said that it's settled as a precedent of the Supreme Court entitled to respect under principles of stare decisis. And one of the important things to keep in mind about Roe v. Wade is that it has been reaffirmed many times over the past uh, 45 years. As Richard Fallon from Harvard said, Roe is not a super precedent because calls for its overruling have never ceased, but that doesn't mean that Roe should be overruled. It just means that it doesn't fall on the small handful of cases like Marbury versus Madison and Brown versus the board that no one questions anymore. With the overturning of Roe, we've, I've seen a, this is a pattern. Um, the dog catches the car, it goes to the states, and then the states go hog wild mm -hmm. and pushing the envelope. We saw that after Shelby v, uh, Shelby v. Holder, um, where states, once they were given the right to change their voting laws, they, they did it and they went the extra mile. And what we're seeing here is states doing the same thing. And now the danger, the danger here is that the Supreme Court is going to allow them to do it. How do you see it? Because Dobbs, Republicans said, was supposed to be about states' rights. Well, first of all, it was supposed to be about getting the courts out of the abortion business. <laughs> uh, and so the, the whole logic was that we'll throw this back in the democratic process. And the idea that they would have the scientific uh, knowledge to overrule the FDA strikes me as pretty, pretty audacious for a set of judges. Uh, President Biden's allies say the fact that he's facing only token primary opposition from author Marianne Williamson and anti-vaccine activists uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. really is a show of strength for him. Oh, for sure. I mean, there's, in the polling, there's still a lot of Democrats who think he should not run, but that's mostly an age issue, not an ideology issue. Uh, but the, the midterm election sort of silenced all that. And he's been looking strong. We give a strong State of the Union. There hasn't been any obvious gaffes, big scandals or anything like that. And so there's nothing, or even ideologically, I'd say over the two years so far, two and a bit, that he's pretty well massaged the center-left fights that happen in the Democratic Party by doing things that some people are centrist like and some things that people on the left like. And so there's no natural home for an opposition candidate. You know, I think what has to concern the White House a little is they've had improving inflation, a lot of good domestic policy uh, uh, achievements. Uh, Republicans have staked out some pretty extreme ground on a lot of issues. And if you look at the polls, it's still reasonably close. His approvals are still in the 46s. And it could be that we're just in an extremely partisan, divided country, an extremely cynical country, where on the national level, nobody and this is global, no national leader gets popular anymore. Hmm. No national leader gets to 55 because there's so much cynicism across the Western world. Yeah. And so, of course, the party, yeah, it's Democrats. Democrats <laughs> are never happy. They're never happy with the person that they have in, in office. And yet, when push comes to shove and they start looking at the alternative, the, the, fingers crossed, the, the Democrats will come home and Americans will come home because the alternative, it, we've been through it before, we don't need to go through it again. The, current, the dominant idea in the Republican Party is that the old party, the Romney-Bush wing, were getting beaten by the left every day of the week and we need a tough guy. And so they're looking for somebody who's a tough guy. And Donald Trump proved he can be a tough guy. And if uh, Ron DeSantis is going to take on Donald Trump, he has to prove he's at least as tough as Trump. And to do that, he has to actually go after Trump. Hmm. And so it's a battle for, you know, who's the dominant alpha male here. And Ron DeSantis is, has painted himself into a position where he won't criticize Trump because he's afraid of losing the pro-Trump people who do support him. And so he's sort of caught in a trap, and it's been a very interesting foil to watch Christi Christie run against Trump. And he's running against Trump and DeSantis simultaneously the way normal people campaign, which is to try to take down the other side. And DeSantis is not doing let's try to take down the other side. That just strikes me as a very hard way to campaign. That's what I've, that's been my perennial question. Does he really want to run? Um, does he have what it takes to do the retail politics that's involved in Iowa and New Hampshire? And we've, we keep reading all these stories about how he does speeches and then he runs off, doesn't glass doesn't hand, engage, doesn't, yeah. do, doesn't engage, doesn't do the rope line. With Donald Trump standing right here, will Ron DeSantis turn to him, look him in the eye, and attack him? And one, and two, how will he respond when the dragon, <laughs> the dragon fires back at him? I have no confidence that Ron DeSantis will do any of those things. Hmm. None. I think the, the thing that strikes me about a lot of coverage this week, a lot of people have said over the years that Fox has ruined the Republican Party. Uh, Tucker and all those people sort of t took over the minds of Republicans and they went crazy. I think what the whole trial shows is that it wasn't Fox doing it to the Republican Party. The Republican Party was running Fox. And that it shows that they did what Tucker and those people, Lou Dobbs and Laura Ingram, believed was not what they were saying on the air. They had to say on the air because their audience was already there. Hmm. And so I think the lesson for me is, from this whole trial is that it's a bottom-up thing, not a top-down thing. that this court, if nothing else, understands the political and social impact that its decisions have had in terms of the party of its seeming preference and the way that they have fared ever since. Is that how you see it? 
Yes. And I think it's really hard to ignore the context in which this is all happening. Right. We have a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on ethics in a few weeks. We have a never ending scandals on the front page involving this court. We have a history of leaks involving Justice Alito, ethics issues involving Justice Thomas. So it's hard to imagine that the court cannot understand that not only are there politics around reproductive freedom and rights at play here, but their image and their remarkably low approval rating by the American people who see them as illegitimate. You know, Lisa, it is, you know, it's interesting because the idea of making the court more diverse was supposed to be that these people with the collegiality with which they normally operate and then getting to know the fact that you've got a Sonia Sotomayor, that you've got an Alita Kagan, that you've now got a Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, means they're now exposed to other points of view and that they would somehow have a better sense of what the world outside of the Supreme Court is like. But it seems to me that Alito has done the opposite. He's become more insular. He's become more angry. He's become more enraged because somehow he believed that the decisions that he wrote, the decision he wrote in Jackson versus Whole Woman's Health would be lauded. Did he think he was a defender of the faith and that people would be cheering in the streets. I'm not sure why they are so surprised, I guess so does the Republican Party, at how much chaos this has caused and how much anger. Well, I think they're angry for a number of reasons, Joy. One is that they don't like being criticized. And Justice Alito has taken a lot of heat over the last year. Some folks pointed to him as a potential source of the leak in the Dobbs decision. He was also criticized for meeting with some donors to the Supreme Court Historical Society. He then gave a speech to a rousing standing ovation, to your point, to the 40th anniversary of the Federalist Society. And he's taken a lot of heat in the intervening time because of that. So I think there's a certain um, intransigence on his part, definitely digging in because of that. But you're right, these people seem further apart than ever before, and the politics of grievance that are infecting our country that lead Donald Trump to be the front runner right now in the Republican race for candidacy for president, the Supreme Court is not immune to that. That politics of grievance seems to be infecting all of our American institutions right now and every branch of government.